Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is business in Hawaii. Actually, this is business beyond Hawaii. This is business going out, outside, way outside Hawaii with, with Richard uh, Wertheimer. And um, he, is, um, he is Fort Street Management. I get that right? Fort Street um, Asset Management, yeah. He's a financial uh, consultant, planner, person. No, uh, I, I, we're fund managers, actually. Fund, fund manager. Ah, yep. thank you. Thank you for straightening me out on that. We're going yeah. to talk about Fort Street in a little while. Sure. But, but the big news here is that you got, you, got to, um, you got to hobnob with CNBC in this national conference with all these names that we know from top to bottom. Um, how, how did that happen, Richard? I mean, you must have friends you don't even know about. I, yeah, it, it was, it was I definitely, at first we didn't, we weren't sure what the event was. So it was, it was a bit, uh, we were invited and we were like, ah, we don't know. And then we looked into it and he goes, you sure you don't want to go? So the way we got the invitation was through uh, the, the guys that we use as our custodian and our trading counterparty, the interactive brokers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were looking for somebody who was setting up a new asset management business. And that could talk, you know, that was different from all the other guys that were there because it is the who's who of not just finance. You know, you had the se uh, Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, and um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Warren was there. So it was, you know, it was all the, the top guys in the, in the industry. Um, and then there was us. So, yeah, I, I think it was just somehow they, you know, our name came up and they, they asked us if we wanted to do it. Um, and we said, absolutely. And it was, you know, usually these events are live, uh, but this one was online, but it was still pretty, it was a lot of fun. It was live online. It was live by, by, by Zoom. Yeah. Correct. I, it, when I first saw the, um, the write-up on it, I said, my God, I can, I can visualize Richard over in the corner there talking to Steve Mnuchin uh, and Owen and like directing, you know, the national fiscal policy or something. Yeah. Yeah, because he's always calling me and asking me for advice. Yeah, I guess. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's yeah. Look, it it, it was it, it is a a lot of these conferences uh, are there are a lot of different types of conferences out there, and this is one that actually people do pay attention to, and they pay a lot of money to go to. Um, and you know, from from our point of view, it was a wonderful opportunity to uh, to mix with these folks and also to get exposure. Uh, you know, at that level, uh, particularly coming from from Hawaii, I think that was you know that was a lot of fun, yeah. uh, and so I think it'll it was a it was it was really fun to do, and it was a great exercise to, to get our name out there. Were you the the only one for, uh, from uh, Fort Street Management? Yeah, it was just well because the way it was set up, it, you they they limit the number of participants, and so uh, yeah, I ended up going or ended up doing it. So what what you speak about? I mean. Uh, I'm sure they were interested in, you know, in talking to somebody from Hawaii. People are always are, um, and they were interested in talking to somebody who was not national, you know, smaller. Uh, so, what what did you present to them? Well, that, that was exactly the point. It was they the 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 topic was setting up a asset management company in the middle of the pandemic, and. But these things, and then what is the strategy and what do you do? And so that's what we focused on mostly was how do you, you know, the, the way that guys like myself who come from an institutional background where we're used to, you know, running money for big uh, fund managers like George Soros and Stan Druck and Miller. And, you know, we were, I was a hedge fund manager for many years. And then uh, coming out of that line of work, and setting up an independent shop and all that entails and can that be done and what are the benefits and what type of investment strategy and how does that, you know, wh why, you know, wh which way is the world going? And the fact that we can do what we're doing with the way we set up in December in the middle of this crisis. Uh, um, December 2019? Yeah, we set up in December, literally. You know, I, I mean... We've been doing this a while. So in terms of the markets, that was not so much of the issue. But, you know, you still have clients and you're onboarding, bringing those clients online. And oh. you, know, you, you wonder if the world's going to end. Um, and you have a lot of there's a lot of moving parts, but it's incredible how how you can set up uh, even in those circumstances. We got up and running and, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, a testament to the technology that's out there and the partners that we used. 
and then also our, our you know, our uh, ability to manage, uh, you know, in, in, you know, money in that, in that time that we were able to uh, raise a substantial amount of money, uh, even in those, you know, during those times. So I think that was the, you know, that was the focus of the, of, of the conversation. Um, you know, how do you build, you know, cause a lot of times it's the big guys that dominate this stuff. And if you looked at the event, it literally, if it was the, it was the top of, you know, top private equity guys, top wealth management companies, Morgan Stanley, and uh, uh, Apollo, Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman was there. Um, uh, it was the, the, the CEO from uh, Vista Capital, uh, Bob Smith. Uh, so it was, it was all the heavy hitters. I mean, you name it, it distressed equity, Mark Lazary. It was just, if, if you're in the business, these are, these are, you can't get bigger names. And, and the point is that, you know, here we are, we're sitting in Hawaii. You know, people say, why Hawaii to begin with? And we're, we're a small guy. We're starting with nothing. Because the, the, the problem when I was in the business to set up the businesses that we used to run, it, it, it would take uh, an army and, uh, you know, and a small fortune just to get going. And so, you know, we're kind of testament to say, well, you know, not necessarily. If you have the right investment strategy and the right experience, and you you understand what's out there in terms of the platform and technology, you can you still have a shot at it. And we've been able to grow. You know, we're just uh, shy you know of hundred million dollars in assets, and we did that in a you know within this year. Um, so I think that's why they kind of they 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 reserved a spot for somebody who's smaller and different, even though you know, we, you know, we have the, the investment credentials, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. This is, we're not newbies. Um, and that, you know, I think there's a powerful statement about the, not just for us, but where the world is going. I mean, it, you know, what, what's happening with technology and what you can do with it. The fact that you and I are having this conversation right now through this medium, you know, we adapt or we get left behind. And that's also part of our investment strategy. So it's kind of all, you know, uh, meets in the middle. Well, if I, if I was organizing a conference like that, I would want to have you there because, uh, you know, it's not so much um, that you're, you know, um, sort of exotic. It's that you demonstrate that the, mar that the market for financial management is robust. <clears throat> it's not something people are running away from. It's something people are succeed, succeeding in and building new businesses. This is a great statement. And if you weren't there, then they, they couldn't make that argument. But, we, but because you're there, you know, you, you fill um, part of the, the takeaway that they had in mind when they set the thing up. That's, that would be my yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and, and the fact that it's um, because of the technology and the structures, like anything you do in life, if you get the right structure, that's 50% of the battle. You know, you, have, you gotta get that set up properly. And so we're able to deliver, a, you know, what we do, uh, an institutional quality of product and service. Um, and we're able to offer that to, you know, to a, a different set of audience. Whereas before it was very bifurcated and very difficult to touch that, uh, you you know you either had to know the person or you had to have a certain amount of money, um, and we 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 are a boutique uh, investment management company, so we are we're fund managers. That's why I made the distinction because uh, the the we are not middlemen, we're not brokers, we're not financial planners, we are not all things to all people. So what's happening with the world is that guys like us who have a very specialized skill set, we offer a global equity portfolio that which we manage and we create ourselves and we run that like a fund. And then we also offer strategic advice on asset allocation, but that's all we do. We don't do anything else. Asset allocation between funds. Yeah. Be, so you no create fund. the fund and then your clientele buy into the fund. Yeah. It, we did what we run one fund by and large, and we mm -hmm. can customize that. And then the oh, other I stuff see. is just how much cash, how much bonds, how much equity, bigger picture, strategic stuff where people are leaning on us for, maybe it's their business type of, cause it's just cause we've been around and our network and we can be helpful and there's a, there's a level of trust. Uh, so it's personalized, but it's yet highly optimized. And the, the main product that we offer is this, our proprietary uh, uh, investment portfolio that has roughly 50 stocks in it globally. And there are no funds, there's no ETFs. It's, it's, it's just 
the you know we we um, you know we it, it's it's uh, what do they call farm to table you know we we bring the stuff you know right we we make the we we grow the stuff ourselves and we we give it to our our customers and we eat our own you know our own cooking as well we take oh, our own man, money man. yeah yeah all the way well so, that's that's the best way isn't it then you, then you you don't have to rely on somebody else uh, on whom perhaps you should not be relying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that's the problem, I think, is that getting to the source is very difficult. A lot of people don't know. And I think the way the world is going, because of the technologies and the, and the, way, the, the way we're operating, people are going to have access to that. And they're going to, once they taste it, they're going, ah, this is the real thing. So in Hawaii, you know, not to toot our tor- horn too much, but you know, we're pretty much the only guys here that have this experience that we can offer. And yeah. Yeah, we're here in Hawaii, partly, even though our business is global um, and our client base is global, we do have some clients here. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's the benefit is that you don't have to be in the money centers anymore. You know, before I used to work with, you know, it was in Hong Kong or San Francisco uh, for most of my career. Um, and we're able to bring that to not just to Hawaii, but we're able to do it out of Hawaii. It's far from the madding crowds. So we, we eliminate a lot of noise, which is if you're a long-term fund manager, that's generally helpful because you know, it's often the case of doing less, not doing more. Um, uh, we find you know, not getting in your way um, and not being swayed by what's you know, the flavor of the month. Yeah. So that is really helpful being in Hawaii. And you know, people, say, you know, people ask, you know, you're, you're a fund manager managing money in Hawaii. It's like, what, how, you know, how'd you win the lottery? You know, it's a, it is an enviable place to do it. Did you tell them you went surfing in the morning? Did you tell them? Did you Absolutely. Tell them that? Well, I think they just take a look. You know, I, I, I tried my best to represent Hawaii at the conference, you know, sporting the Aloha shirt. And, you know, even though we're not from here, uh, at least the spirit of it. But I think that's, you know, it's really powerful that you can do that now. I mean, to me, it was also a bit of a, you know, I, I was semi-retired and sort of had been managing money and thought I just I won't be able to do that again. And now we're up and running and doing it in a way and in a format that works for me and I think works for the clients that, you know, that we have. And, and then the business can evolve. It's, it's, and it's a lot of fun that way. You know, you, you're, you're, it really is the future. I mean, not, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, it is. I mean, you can have whatever style of life you want to have. You can be wherever you want to be and then you can get on the electronics and do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter where you are. No, it's no, the future. Uh, it is. I mean, if, if uh, obviously, you know, some travel, uh, is, you know, is and, and person to person, face to face meetings are still, you know, you, you can't replace that, but you do realize that I can do a lot without it, you know, particularly for our business. It's, it, it's very much, it suits us very well in terms of what we do. Uh, we don't, we don't need to be. You can, you can pick the travel. You can say, well, you know, I, I may not do the, you know, the grand possibilities uh, if I don't travel, but, you know, I'll be able to do a lot of other stuff if I don't travel so I can make a choice about that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, and, and it allows for, you, know, you look at a place like Hawaii, there are, you know, there are a lot of financial advisors out there and, and planners, brokers, you know, stockbrokers, we used to call them. Um, God bless them. You know, there, there's a, there's a role for it. I'm not, I'm not, you know, but it's, you know, but there should be more. You should have, you should, you should have an option of seeking out something different. And we're a testament to that, that here we are, yeah. you know, we're, yeah. um, we're not for everybody. Are, are you saying the stock brokers have gone out of, out of, uh, out of favor, out of phase? Well, well, they've changed, you know, in the old days, when I started in the business, it was, they were, were called stock brokers. I, I was not, part of that business that was a retail business was the institutional side of it um i think now it has connotations of i don't want to say a dirty name but of, of a middleman that uh is not uh they've changed that to financial advisors that you're advising that you're on the side of the table as your client there's nothing wrong with that that's great and and they are i mean they're you know the, the, that that is their goal but i i'm very skeptical that they can do everything. You know, there are certain things that they do very well. So it's, it's, these things aren't binary and, and it's evolving, but yeah. you should have a choice. So for some, for many people, a financial advisor fulfills a very important role. 
Um, well, it sounds like it, it changes like everything else around us. <laughs> I mean, furthermore, it's changing even during COVID. I mean, those changes may be accelerating in some way. So what kind of response did you get? I know you weren't physically there rubbing shoulders with those guys. Yeah, I mean, it would have been a lot. You are, yeah, it would have been better, but there really you are in a group, and I'm certainly they responded. They probably had Q and A. Uh, um, how did you feel it went? Uh, how did you feel? You know, they they thought about your, your comment. Well, they, 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 it went well. I mean, as from what I could tell, uh, the uh, I think we're going to end up on the interactive website um, as a testament for them. So it was good promotional material for them. Uh, the CNBC called back, said it was fantastic, that it went really well, and they got a lot of response from that. We had a lot of Q and A. People were really interested, interested to know how I set up, and also my, our background and, and what we do, and our and our view on the markets and our strategy. Um, so that was, uh, and that seemed to be, you know, very well received. Uh, it would have been, you know, it would have been nice if it was real time, we'd be able to talk to people, you know, uh, in person. Um, but, uh, like I said, it was a good, it was a good exercise in, in, in getting out there and, and telling our story. Um, uh, you know, we are passionate about what we do. Um, and, you know, and also getting some degree of validation, you know, people hear that you're on CNBC at yeah. that type of event, uh, you know, you, you you're probably not a complete, you know, idiot. Uh, well, I, I think you you're, you're part of their, you're part of their, their group now. Right. Um, it would not surprise me very much if uh, I turned on the television and watched CNBC and, and there you were. Hey, I, know I know that guy. Well, I <laughs> used to back, back in the day when I was in Hong Kong when they were just starting with CNBC in Hong Kong. I often went on the show uh, to talk about China and sometimes would do the interview actually in Chinese. Um, which oh, that's was, right. Yeah, well, let, yeah. let me take a digressionary moment. You, you left Queens. Um, you studied Definitely. Mandarin. Uh, you got to be a taxi driver uh, in in China, uh, and they they got they 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 found you there. The government found you and said, Richard, you you can't do this without the appropriate papers. You have to leave now. And you said, Where, where shall I go? Um, and they said, why, why don't you go to Taiwan? And then and you said, This is my my punchline. I'm sure you remember it. Um, you said, I can't go to Taiwan. I don't speak Thai. <laughs> it's, uh, it's true. You know, I was, I was all of 19 or 20 years old at the time. And I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, you know, uh, and even on the CNBC at the show, the, uh, guy Adami who does fast money, uh, did the, uh, was the moderator and he was fascinated he was like how did you end up in China? why did you go you know i was like what, what were you thinking i was like i don't know i wasn't really thinking and uh, you know you have a you have some sort of plan uh it's it's you know it's it's a plan that is uh based on you know uh, a, a young 19 year old male you know what he's what he's looking for fame and fortune uh and, and fun um, and yeah, that was, uh, it's just one thing led to another. And before you know it, you're sure. there and you're, you know, you, you've established uh, your roots and you have a career. And, but that was, you know, that, that is, uh, it was a wonderful experience. And again, to come back to the United States, and do what we're doing here, you know, I, it's, I, I'm very careful. And I know we did that one, uh, it's actually probably one of the only talks that I did on China was with you guys uh, for the Harvard Club. And a lot of people saw that. And I, I you know, my, my friends that are in China uh, as long or not longer than me, and there aren't many, because I went there just as it was opening, which is 30 some odd, 35 years ago. Uh, they were like, what were you thinking? You know, because to call yourself an expert is just, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. But um, I do think it's really important that one thing that we can bring uh, you know, not, not, you know, through our business and through our fun, it is obviously having a, an informed global view and the importance of China, as we as we see today, that, you know, we, we need to understand the world needs to understand, I, you know, and I, 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 you know, coming back here is, is, is almost a bit of a mission uh, to let people know of what's going on over there. Not that we have all the answers, you know, but, but just, a, it's, it's just our interpretation. Yeah, you're, you're in a better position, not only because you're experienced in China, but because you're in Hawaii and Hawaii has a different view of, of Asia than the mainland. I, I believe a more sophisticated view. But let me let me go to that. I, I do. I, I actually 
you know, usually I look at this stuff electronically, but I, I printed out your- uh, Oh, the last note, like, yeah. Yeah, your last uh, market update, I guess called in September. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting. It's short, relatively speaking, like two or three pages. Uh, <clears throat> and it tells, it tells what's going on. And I really, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you some questions, um, you know, of you as a, a professional fund manager, you know, de deal with. So what's, what is going on? We, we're in the middle of COVID. We're in the middle of a contested election. We're in the middle of a lot of national strife and threat. Lots of it. International, too. We're in, we're in terrible shape, a lot of people think. Mm. Um, and yet you seem optimistic. Mm. I mean, relatively speaking for sure. that sort of environment. What, can you give me your analysis on it? Sure, I mean, uh, uh, the, you know, first and foremost, our approach to managing money is, is very long-term. And I mean, five, 10 plus years we're looking at. So we're not trying to, you know, trying to prognosticate or prognosticate on the markets and, and, and what's going on. We can do that, we have a view, but ultimately it comes down to, for us, the fundamentals and getting that right. But, but in, in terms of being optimistic, or at least uh, we recognize that the world is in a funny place. And uh, both, you know, from the, that, that's not even related to COVID. Uh, even beforehand, there's a lot of, you know, changes is, is happening. And so I, I guess on two sides, first and foremost for COVID, We've, you know, when, when COVID happened, we did a lot of studying of past pandemics and quickly realized that, you know, as, as horrible as it is and as horrible as it feels, humankind adapts to pandemics. We figure out a way to cope. And, and so that, you know, the difficulty that's there, uh, we have a lot of faith in, in our ability to deal with uh, the pandemic. And we're seeing that. And that's what's happened with the markets are obviously showing that. And that particularly relates to technology. And so you talk about optimism. So on, you know, when, when you look at the world today, there are a lot of troubles out there. And the future, yes, there are some risks that we see and things may get worse before they get better. But our belief is that we are in a very long-term technological revolution. It started in the 1970s and 80s with the advent of the IC chip and the internet. And this is a continuation of what's happening now. And so as, you know, it, it, I actually think that we are living in a remarkable period with unimaginable possibilities. Yes, the possibilities are that things can get worse, but the tools and the things that are happening in our lives, like we were talking earlier about our business, that, that is, we are just midstream in, in the development of these, of these changes in how we live and how we work. And I, I think there's a lot to be very optimistic about. You know, and I, and I think it's very easy to get lost in, in the things that are in front of us. But I think that things are shifting in a way that these are seminal events and it gives us a lot of hope. So when you, we, we like to put pen to paper, we do it first and foremost for ourselves and then our clients, we share that with whether it's on specific companies or on trends or on the markets, we continuously do that in addition to the investor letters that we send out every quarter. And, you know, it, it just forces us to really take a look and take inventory of what's happening and not to get caught up in, you know, in, in the politics of it. I mean, you know, for instance, politics on the markets, they don't drive prices, even though everybody thinks it does. It doesn't. It, short term, sure, it goes up and it goes down. But that's not our game. Trying to, and I spent years as a trader, trying to predict whether the market's going to go up or down in a given period is a fool's game. I mean, there are some people that can do it successfully, consistently, but very few. Um, and yes, there are times when you win the lottery, you can go to Las Vegas and you can put everything on 22 red and you can win. It's much better to invest on a long-term basis and really take stock of what's happening and let that money, let it work. Because that's the way, that's really where you compound uh, your returns. And it takes time and you have to be patient and you have to have faith and you have to do your homework. And if you do that and you have that confidence whether it's through somebody else like ourselves or by yourself, that allows you to stay the course. So even when there are shocks, external shocks, ex exogenous shocks, you have the ability to not be flustered and you stay the course and you stay invested. And that's the best advice that, you know, that, that we have 
figured out over the many years of doing it wrong. I, I would, I would have, um, you know, I, I, I do uh, feel strongly about tech. I think, and, and tech demonstrates that it's strong these days. Um, you know, communications tech, all, all the uh, big tech companies doing well, and, and Congress hasn't shafted them yet. That may happen later, but not yet. Yes. Um, and I, and I, but then I noticed that in your newsletter, you, you're talking about big cap also, and you're more into big cap than you were into tech. Can you, can you, you know, if, if I just go on my gut, I would buy every tech stock around because I, as so, you say, you know, the magic yeah. is there and, and that's, what's going to drive the world, but yes. big cap, why big cap? So, so for, well, well, there are a couple of reasons. The first thing is tech has a lot of different meanings to different people. When I talk about technology, it doesn't have to be a tech company. It could be Nike that is adopting a much more online strategy. So it, it, it's just that the world is changing and we need to adapt to that. Um, in, in terms of, you know, and, and, and even bigger, I mean, when you talk about big trends, the biggest trend out there is by far the end of carbon. I mean, we are going to an electric world or a solar, uh, uh, you know, renewable energy world. And that, that is, in, in my view, that is bigger than the pandemic. That transition is going to be a, a, a investors need to be plugged into that over the next couple of decades. Um, in terms of big cap, to answer your question, so we run we're not running a strategy uh, that is trying to shoot the lights out um, and you know go for broke. We are trying to position the portfolio for the future, and we're trying to do it in a way that gives us uh, a, I don't wanna say a balanced approach, but a more reasonable shot at not being blown up and being able to sleep at night. Now, it's very important that what we do, we try to differentiate ourselves from the index. Because if you want the index, go and buy the S&P. It's easy and it's cheap. God bless you, nothing wrong with that. What we do is we are actually looking for what we call tracking error. We're trying not to be correlated, but yet at the same time, we don't wanna be shaken out of our portfolio and our positions. So big cap gives us that confidence. There is a certain comfort and a certain, uh, uh, you know, there's, this, there's a fundamental reason if a company reaches a, a certain level of market capitalization, there's a, good, there's a good point, there's a good possibility or a good chance that they're not going down or if they fall, they're not gonna collapse. And so that's, that, that's a big reason why we have a significant amount of big caps. And now, don't get me wrong, we do want to have exposure to those smaller, uh, not micro small, but smaller companies that have explosive growth. And we do, we have those. And we have a, what we call a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a, uh, high growth portfolio of about 10 to 15 stocks that are, you know, they could be anywhere from, you know, a couple of billion dollars market cap to 15, $20 billion, uh, that, that, future looks very, very bright and with explosive growth. So we want to have some of those. We can sprinkle some of those in the portfolio. Uh, you know, if we, we toy around with the idea of, of, of having a portfolio that is mostly compromised with those type of names, but it's just, you know, you, you're, you're dialing up the risk uh, that we don't, we don't need, you know, th this started by me looking at my money and how I wanted to manage it. And if I was, it was about protecting the assets and preserving them. Hence the big cap uh, part of it. Not being completely 100% technology, even though technology is is mostly in the portfolio in one form or another, directly or indirectly. And how can I compound our returns over time, but in a sensible fashion? So that's why I said that balance. But at the same time, you know, the human nature is um, is we we are twice. Of two times amount afraid to lose money than we are to gain, and so that is a, a, a you know they've done academic research on that, and your average fund manager probably ten times uh, afraid, and so what they do is they end up hugging an index, um, and underperforming ultimately because if you're going to hug an index, you're going to underperform. So the way that you actually do well is by taking a different approach and tr and and being different, not for to be not for different sake, but because that's where the real uh, that's where the juice is. That's, that's where the outperformance is. It's in taking those smart, calculated bets, doing your homework and finding those type of companies 
uh, in the sectors that are actually going to offer a differentiated profile. Uh, and so we're very clear about that. We're, we're a boutique fund manager that we're not trying to be all things to all people. Um, and there's going to be times we're going to underperform, uh, even though our track record has been really, really good over the last five or six years. Um, uh, but we do recognize that, you know, by being different, you know, it, it, it's like anything. If all you want is to protect your downside, you're never going to make any money. So you got you got to accept risk. It, 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 it's part of it's sure. part and parcel of life. This is it's like when I went to China initially, it was risky. I was 19 years old. I was like, you know, OK, we're going to take some risk. I, I'm here. I didn't die. You know, I actually learned a thing or two you know, yeah. over time um, and we're better for it. So yeah. you know, we're, we're continually. I think that what we're seeing with the, with the pandemic, you know, there are there are lessons there that you know, you, the, the obstacle is the way that in crisis, there is opportunity. You know, the Chinese have a word called weiji and it means danger, but it's, it's composed of two characters. The first character, wei, is risk. And the second character, ji, is ji hui de ji, is opportunity. And so, I, you know, often what we do and how we approach our business and how we approach our friends and the people we want to help is understanding that, you know, you, you don't want to shy away from, from, from those opportunities. And, you know, the pandemic, unfortunately, has really shaken a lot of people and the media has not helped um, uh, you know, uh, in, I think, scaring people. And I think that, yes, and I'm not, I'm not belittling or minimizing by, by any stretch what's happening. Uh, these are real, you know, risks and, and we have some real challenges politically, sociologically, economically, and for these, you know, and what I view is a, is, a, is a technological golden age that we are, that's in front of us. And I really do wholeheartedly believe that. We're going to have to change how we live and how we operate and how we work together uh, to really make that come true. So there's always risks, but, you know, that's part of the fun. Sure, absolutely. So um, there's one last question I want to ask you about, and that's this. So you go... you. Go is the wrong word. I keep thinking it's a geographical thing. You participate, you know, in this uh, the CNBC program, and you're you're on a panel among what a dozen a dozen panels or something like that. And, and invariably, <clears throat> there these guys, the, the big cap, uh, the, the big banks, uh, the big the big managers, <clears throat> they're going to be telling you their theory, the way you have just told me your theory. And I and I'm sure that. If you were there, you had the opportunity to there, meaning electronically there, you had the opportunity to listen to them all, or at least a number of them, and get the idea of where they were on these kinds of issues. Hmm. So my question to you, Richard, is are, are you in the center of, of the array of opinions you heard from all these guys at this program, uh, and women too, lots of women? Mm. Uh, uh, are you on uh, the more conservative side, the more liberal side? Where do you fit? Where does your philosophy fit? If you if you could make that kind of judgment, uh, hearing them out at the program. I, it's, a, it's a great question, Jay. I you know I would say most of the most of the of the commentary and the speakers most of the, most of, I, of, the, of the commentary that I heard, even you know uh, I'm a even from somebody like Senator Warren, uh, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, but you know, I differ a lot in terms of, uh, uh, say, you know, political approach or ideology. But she's a very smart person. She's got some great ideas. I mean, there are some real problems with our system, the way that capitalism is today. I recognize as a capitalist and as a probably financially, you know, fiscally conservative, but uh, socially liberal, I guess, you know, uh, is probably how I describe myself. Um, but I do, you know, that, that that's, a, a, there were a lot of views there that, um, that talked about that, that talked about empowerment and how, how important it was to have a diverse set of views in, you know, in a leadership position, you know, whether it's, you know, all different walks of life and people from all different types of backgrounds. I mean, it makes sense and it's, the evidence is there. So, you know, at, at the same time that uh, I think there is a recognition that, you know, we're going to have to adapt to how things are going. You can't, things don't say the same. You know, I, 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 it was funny as I was listening to all the, the conversations, I thought back that, 
you know, I, I was I was born in you know, 1964, which is what 19 some odd years after World War II, and you know, family came out of you know, out of out of Germany, out of the Holocaust, and that wasn't that long ago. And so I think when you listen to all these people talking about this, you recognize that things don't stay the same. Um, so I, I guess I would say I was probably somewhat in. It, it really depended on the issue. I, I, it's hard to say I was in the center or on the right or the left. Um, you know, I, I, but I, I, I do think that uh, we need to recognize how lucky we are to be in the United States. And having spent my entire, most of my entire adult life outside of the United States, I appreciate that. For all its problems that we have and challenges that we have, whether it's nationally or here in Hawaii, you know, we should be grateful for what we have. And I can tell you, even like my portfolio, I spent most of my career investing in China. That was my expertise in and around Asia but mostly China. And our portfolio is mostly in the US. Why is that? We live in an incredibly uh, dynamic, robust, innovative country that is ugly and sloppy. It's not organized like China, which is, which is also growing and has tremendous opportunities. It's done in a different way. And so, you know, when you listen to these people at the panel, you realize, wow, you know, there's some, these are smart people with, with uh, you know, uh, I'm in good company, so to speak. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations, uh, Richard, uh, on, on being involved in a CB, CNBC Delivery Alpha Investor Conference. I, I know we will see you on the national media again. And, uh, you know, I mean, gee whiz, uh, being involved in that program is really something. It's almost like uh, appearing on Think Tech Hawaii. I, uh, not quite, not quite that level. Because I did tell my brother uh, and he, he didn't believe me. He actually had to go check. And he, and he said, yeah, you, you know, what was the last time you were on ThinkTech? <laughs> Thank you, Richard. It's great to talk to you. Be well. Stay safe. Anytime, Jay. Thank you.